So, World IPv6 launch, what was it? June 6, 2012, uh, a number of organizations around the world came together in a collaborative effort uh, to actually make a concrete and uh, substantial step forward in terms of IPv6 deployment. Content providers turned on IPv6 on their websites permanently. Access providers uh, made IPv6 available as a regular service with a minimum of 1% of their traffic towards the content providers participating over IPv6, and also CPE vendors participating, and we're going to see today why that's incredibly important. Uh, participating CPE vendors agreed to have IPv6 on by default in their product line going forward. What it was not, turning off IPv4 anywhere. Um, and if you missed Sunset 4 yesterday, you missed a lot of fun <laughs> about the reality of turning off IPv4, not anytime soon, K. Okay, thanks. Um, so important takeaways, IPv6 is in fact launched, um, and that this was really a phenomenal collaborative industry event for anyone who was doubtful that we could actually do anything collaborative and outside of business interests anymore. This is a good proof point that that doesn't need to be the case. Um, we will go through a lot of material today. There's a lot more material that can be uh, found at the World IPv6 launch site. Uh, there will be follow-up blog posts from today and more data that will be ongoing. Also, it's not too late if you are an access provider, it's not too late to sign up. Uh, the content providers are continuing to do measurements through the end of this year. So uh, we are actually going to be able to see how things are tracking through, um, through the end of this year. So the panel, um, apart from myself, we have Matt Ford from the Internet Society, George Michelson from APNIC. John Pazowski, Comcast, Lorenzo Calivi, Google, Lee Howard from Time Warner Cable, and Eric Nygren from uh, Akamai, who will be speaking in uh, probably approximately that order. Um, so I have asked the panelists to provide remarks, which is why the slide deck is 58 slides long. Um, and so they will each be speaking uh, to concrete impacts and, and notice effects from World IPv6 launch um, with slides and charts. But I do want to make sure that there is time afterwards for discussion among the panelists and then also discussion with you all in the room uh, and some of the folks who are online as well. So uh, I will therefore take up no more time, apart from reminding us that we are going to have to keep a close eye on the time. Um, and I am offering um, six minutes to each of the panelists. Uh, parting word, this is Jago. And for anyone who's a CJ Cherry fan, You'll know that Jago is an assassin, so be careful. <laughs> okay, thanks, Leslie. I'm just going to touch on some of the uh, the high points you know, from a from an overall perspective, and then let these guys get into some of the more um, uh, low-level detail about what they saw from the event. Um, so. I'm just going to look at the networks that we saw, the websites, and some of the traffic statistics. So we had, we had literally hundreds of networks sign up for this um, for a variety of reasons. We're not able to um, measure all of the networks and the percentage of IPv6 traffic. Um, you know, networks have to achieve a certain scale before we can reliably measure them uh, in this exercise. So uh, we had a total of 69 networks um, achieve measurable deployment um, with an average in excess of 0.1% of their traffic being IPv6 to um, major content providers that were uh, providing us with measurement statistics. And what I really want to emphasize from these statistics, which are probably not terribly legible to you, even with this enormous screen, um, but will be available online, is that you know, although there are a lot of research networks in this list, um, they're not at the top. The networks at the top are major broadband ISPs um, in France, North America, and interestingly in Romania. Um, so you know, for a long time the criticism for IPv6 deployment has been, well, it's only, it's only happening in research networks and it's certainly not happening in North America. And that is simply not true anymore. The other thing I want to emphasize, in addition to the, the, um, the geographic distribution of these networks, which is uh, illustrated on the, the uh, I guess, your right uh, on this slide, is that um, the percentages of IPv6 traffic are not trivial either. Um, so free, for example, I mean, these statistics are from the 11th of June. Um, at that point, we had an average of seven, over 17% over IPv6 traffic. Um, 
similar numbers for the the, uh, the the Romanian networks. And so, you know, these are these are real, really substantial IPv6 deployments on major broadband access networks all over the world. And the other thing I will mention about this is we'll be, we're going to be updating these numbers through the end of this year. So um, keep an eye on that website that Leslie gave you a point or two um, to see how this evolves. So that was the network's um, website. Uh, similarly, um, a really, a, a truly global effort. I mean, we you know, had website participation from all around the world. And um, the, uh, the graph at the bottom there, which is from Lars Eggert's um, uh, Deployment Trends website, uh, shows you a couple of things that <clears throat> on World IPv6 Day, which is this spike, um, well, middle of last year, um, you can see that you know there was a, a major increase in the number of websites serving IPv6, and then that kind of that kind of went away. Um, and then sixth uh, of June this year, uh, a much much larger increase in the number of uh, major websites serving IPv6. The red line is the Alexa Top 500. Um, it reaches almost 25% of the top 500 websites around the world, and um, it doesn't go away. It, it's, it's permanent. We had over, over 2,000 websites turn off IPv6 um, on the 6th of June as part of our World IPv6 launch. And this is my last slide. I just wanted to mention that on, you know, as far as traffic is concerned, obviously it's very dependent on where you're, where you're uh, observing from. But um, these uh, graphs, the, the top one from the Amsterdam Internet Exchange, the bottom one from the uh, from DKIX, um, you know, show a, a major uh, impact on IPv6 traffic levels from uh, well, IPv6 launch, and again, a sustained, a sustained uh, impact on IPv6 traffic levels. So, um, really, what I wanted to get across is the this, this was a truly global um, event and um, a major step change in the uh, the level of IPv6 deployment in access networks and uh, on, on content providers around the world. So uh, I guess I'll hand it over to George. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll try and get mine out of the way fairly quickly so you can get to the real information. We're quite interested in the idea of providing a publicly visible count of what's been going on worldwide. And the real thing here is to get high numbers of figures, to get millions of figures. The easy way to do it is to be Google because everyone goes there, but we didn't have that luxury. So we were interested in a technique for measuring IPv6 uptake that would let us get to large numbers of end users. And we lucked onto this feature of advertising that there's a way we can run one by one image fetches in Flash. And if you adjust your bidding paradigm in the Flash advertising model, you can actually preference views over clicks, which allowed us to get a really high number of views in flashback ads. And that gave us a large coverage of fairly unique IPs worldwide to do some IPv6 measurement from. Um, we've put up a URL that's providing the breakdowns, and you can see this by ASN, by Economy, and by some organizations like G8, G20, OECD, because of the places we're targeting the data. We think we're getting enough data that we can actually make some good inferences for about 150 economies worldwide on the monthly aggregates. And if you go to the ASN level, there's about 2,000, 2,500 that we see data for. We actually do see 35,000 ASN in the collection, but a large number of them don't provide very much. We got um, 60 hits from the Vatican City, but I can't tell you whose hand was on the keyboard. And unfortunately, <laughs> there was no V6 there, but you know, maybe on the seventh day. <laughs> um, so we're providing some basic um, visualizations using the Google Charts API, and we're deliberately doing this to try and encourage a sense of um, inter-economy comparisons. And you get a takeaway message from this very quickly that the distribution of V6 to end users is really quite variable by economy. It's not as straightforward as saying that it's the G8 that are doing it and it's the other economies that aren't. It really depends a lot on the nature of your economic investment, the timelines for your mobile plant upgrade, broadband upgrade, you know, what kind of machines people are buying, what their cycles are. So it's not an even distribution. Um, we're also doing some charting. The numbers for Canada, this is actually based on quite a high sample count. It's very noisy. There is an upward trend, but it's somewhat slow. Whereas if you compare that to America, for instance, 
this is a really compelling story of a continuous uptake rate that I think is largely dr um, driven by people that are going to be speaking later on the table. This is a good story. I, I think you're used to us standing up saying, woe is me, woe is me, six isn't happening. It's happening. You know, this is actually quite an interesting story. These are large numbers. So we're also providing a chart of the UN economies that's a sorted list, so you can actually see this as a comparative. And we're um, putting the imputed numbers based on the known internet user populations into this. And if you refactor this to sort by estimated V6 user population, you start to see the kinds of numbers that are now reasonably intuited to be doing V6 online. So that's 3 million from America, 2.3 from China, 2 million in Japan, 2 in France. These are pretty solid numbers. I mean, okay, it's a 1.2 billion population online, but these are non-trivial numbers of people that are now using V6 on a routine basis. So we also do a breakdown for the World V6 launch participants, which gives you a similar sense. And you can see there another confirmation of this really very high number that popped up in Romania from One Network's investment, but some of the numbers that we're seeing from other participants. Um, I would like to say thank you to the Internet Society and Google, who very kindly provided us with uh, sponsorship to do some of this measurement, and the ISC and RIPE, who've been doing hosting of the activity. But if you do see our advert at any stage, please don't click. It only costs us one. Hello, folks. How are you? Okay, so I want to break, move right into some of the Comcast stuff here. Uh, I promised Leslie to keep it short, so there are four slides. Uh, so at this stage of the game, uh, we are at uh, we, we measure our active our active penetration, our, our active you know, customers that are actively using IP6 to be approximately two percent. That's about a hundred percent increase based on our measurements from a you know, late May, so it's a few weeks before the actual World V6 launch uh, date itself of June 6th. 70% uh, of those devices are individual computers that are connected to a cable modem. The remaining 30% are home routers. The interesting, the interesting piece of data here is that this shift is changing dramatically over uh, in, in just two short months. Uh, right before World V6 launch, um, the mix was 76%-ish cable computers and 24% um, home routers. And uh, this is starting to move towards what we typically see as part of our you know, you know, typical business as usual type of, uh, you know, uh, usage patterns or uh, you know, across the broadband network. We have deployed IP6 to approximately half of our network at this stage of the game. Uh, so there are a very large number of people who could, who could start using IP6 if they had a home router that's 40 v 6 and was turned on, et cetera. Um, so the, the point to drive home here is that we have about 2% penetration of the overall network at this stage of the game. Um, and we've deployed to half the network. I think you'll hear more about this in a few minutes from Lee, so I won't say anything further on this front. The overall traffic patterns that we're seeing here um, as part of our rollout are still less than 1%. One interesting tidbit, um, and, and Glenn, don't, don't get mad at me here, um, is we've seen about 6% of uh, our uh, of YouTube streaming uh, of the Olympics over V6 from our network. Uh, it was, a, it was a, some, some data points that came in recently, so I had to make some updates to the slides, and Leslie was very patient with me on that front. So thank you, Leslie. Um, so as you can imagine, the bulk of the, the, bulk of the standalone computers uh, are really Microsoft devices connected to connected to modems. They represent about 65% of the devices uh, that are using V6 on the network today. Uh, customer home routers, we, haven't, we just simply haven't had the time to, to turn through some of the data. But we do know that the bulk of these routers are, are, are home routers that are available through you know, retail channels, right? So the Apples, the Links, Linksys of the world. Uh, we also have seen a significant surge in interest across open source platforms, PFSense, FreeBSD, Linux-based devices. Uh, we're actually working to publish some of that information openly on our website, uh, our Comcast 6 portal, so that if people wish to do it, like in this crowd, for example, um, they, can, they can see what configurations have worked for other users on the Comcast network. Uh, we hope that at some point in the not distant future, we can come back and share with you a breakdown, um, more specifically of the of the, the home router population. We think that that would be very uh, an interesting data point to, to kind of uh, kind of discuss here, particularly amongst this crowd. So the adoption rate again, more more new data. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we've heard is, is varying reports of what you know when you in the launch V6, you know for for a customer. 
what overall traffic for that particular customer is, you know, actually ends up being B6 uh, once you turn it on. Uh, so we've we've seen some numbers that are higher than 40%, but basically the, the the conservative number now, because this is still pretty new data for us, is about 40%. So um, uh, we're working to get more of a breakdown on that, not only by application and protocol, but also by make and model. Uh, again, some more very interesting data because one of the things that we feel is important to highlight here is that if we understand what devices are not using v6 we can then use that as an opportunity to maybe you know feed you know have feedback here within this community but also continue to work more with consumer electronics one of the things that we feel is pretty significant is you know that there while there is a growing momentum for v6 across consumer electronics in the form of home networking the other part of consumer electronics your televisions your rokus all the other things still need some tlc as far as v6 is concerned um, so we are, you know, we, we're, we're, we're hoping to leverage some of this analysis to, to kind of help make the case and help people understand really where some of the additional focus is required from B6 point of view. Um, just as an aside, uh, some of the data that we've seen as far as that per customer um, usage of V6, uh, obviously I think many people here would expect YouTube and Netflix, but one of the things that has recently shown up is the iTunes App Store. So I don't know if uh, anybody can, you know, reject or confirm that, but, but based on our analysis so far, that appears to be the case. Uh, and of course, this figure does not currently include any of the Olympic streaming over uh, YouTube. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we are looking to kind of dive a little bit deeper into you know some more of the, some of the information around you know what is exactly is using V6 and what is not. Uh, so hopefully more to come on that front. And on a slightly different topic, and um, and this is kind of related to our overall strategy as it relates to the role of V6 before. Several months before World V6 launch, we had initiated, you know, kind of a sub-project for V6 where we, uh, across various regions in our network, we have run a series of measurements. Uh, and we we're doing this because we want to make sure that when, as we launch V6 and as folks, you know, who, who enable content with V6, they intersect, that we don't have an adverse customer experience. One of the things that, that we are repeatedly reminded of internally as, as it relates to V6 is not to, not to die the death of a thousand cuts. Um, so this was an effort that we had spun up and we intend to keep running for, for some time where we continue to monitor and measure the customer experience. So what we do is, is we run a series of tests from various regions across our network um, and we basically run both V4 and V6 tests. We kind of calculate a ratio to basically see what the performance, the overall performance is and we use that to make sure that, that again the customer experience is intact. In many cases this ultimately is a trigger for us to reach out to folks and say hey wait a minute our users in Chicago are having, our customers in Chicago are having a hard time getting to your content in Chicago over V6. Could we please do something to fix this? Uh, this is a very important part of the rollout here. Um, and it, it's, it's an area where we're starting to collect a lot of data, which again, we feel will be very interesting to this community. We, we didn't put a lot of it in here for a variety of reasons. I felt it was probably okay to use the Internet Society as an example, since you know this is an ISOC uh, sponsored event here. Uh, so as you can see, there is an example of some of the data right from our dashboard, and you'll see that the overall experience for our customers is 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 pretty close as far as the Internet Society's website is concerned. Um, but there are a number of websites out there that are not. Uh, so as as you know, we continue to expand the rollout, and other people continue to enable our content. Uh, we continually watch this to make sure that we work with you know our partners on the in, in the internet ecosystem for the benefit of our common our common customer. Um, and of course, a lot of this is not based on randomness. It's you know it's basically the, the, the most popular um, content or site that people are going to. So we try to make it as relevant as possible. Uh, and that is it. I'll hand it over to Lorenzo. Thanks, John. So um, I'll try to be brief as well. Um, mostly, I'll be focusing on the measurements that we saw from our perspective. Um, so. Uh, as you may know, um, most Google web services have supported IP6 for a long, for a long time now. Um, we added a few more. We particularly, specifically, we turned on IP6 SMTP support. Um, but the focus uh, for World IP6 launch was not so much on services because we'd done all that work already, but to sort of help other participants prepare and publish data and help the committee actually take actionable decisions on you know, how to shape the event. Um, so we. We wrote a tool that the committee could use to actually you know, track deployment and um, you know, you know, sort the participants and you know, see what was going on. 
Um, and of course, we, we publish ongoing statistics about IPv6. So you can see them at google.com slash IPv6 slash statistics. <clears throat> we measure um, 2.5x growth of IPv6 traffic over the last year. Um, and if anything, it's accelerating. Um, if we, and this is on top of v4 growth, of course. So it's basically 2.5x per year that v6 is gaining compared to IPv4. If you extrapolate that as uh, the pointy-haired bosses types like to do, you get to 50% of traffic in about six years uh, or 100% in seven years. So um, that graph is being constantly updated. We plan to keep it up for a while. Um, we also measure IPv6 breakage. This was a major, major focus of World IPv6 launch because um, it's so important to ensure uh, that you know there's no bad user experience. If people really like Google to be reliable and up all the time, and if there are hotspots with bad v6 performance, we, we really need to um, act on those. So we worked with, we have sophisticated measurements. We've been running them for a long time. And we've been working with major networks to figure out if there, were any, if there was any breakage in their networks. And in some cases, even enable them to you know, gain the confidence that they needed to participate in World IPv6 launch. So we feel that that was a very important activity. Um, this is not scalable, of course, going out to individual networks and trying to help them fix their problems. Uh, but um, it was it was a useful before launch because if you're not actually publishing content, it's very hard to see if there are any problems because users don't notice them. So it was we felt that it was very important for us to to sort of work together with networks. We warned users and we <clears throat> publish a list of networks that we don't enable IPv6 for. We publish that. Um, in the interest of transparency, and so that any website operator that wants to can uh, use that list and avoid handing out IPv6 for networks that um, where there's user impact. Um, we see um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that we see some networks that have um, responded to World IPv6 launch by filtering out all Quad A records at their DNS servers. Um, we don't think this is a good idea because the underlying problem doesn't go away; it's just masked. And once you mask the problem, it becomes very difficult to measure it. And um, once you can't measure it, you don't know when to turn the filtering off. So, so that's, that's a difficult, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. It's very hard to get out of it. Um, of course, there's you know, policy issues, censorship issues, and so on. Um, this is a major Japanese ISP. You can see that they were very conservative around World IPv6 Day last year. Then they disabled the filtering, and then they turned it on again here. And I presume that they're going to keep it on forever until the, the sort of a significant, you know, until the majority of their users has en enabled IPv6. Um, one of the effects, of course, is collateral damage. This is another Japanese network. They filtered out IPv6 on their recursive resolvers, and all every six use dropped to zero because all the users that did have IPv6 couldn't get to websites anymore. Um, it's not just Japan. Uh, this is a Greek, a Greek ISP. Um, there is speculation that this is caused by a particular CPE manufacturer that apparently announces six bone space to the home. And um, it's, 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 I, I think that the um, network was not able to secure a fix or something, and so. So what happened uh, in launch? Well, our, one of the metrics that we like to track is how many search queries per second there are. Um, and you can see that we had a modest increase of 75% on launch day. This is because we had already, basically, we were enabling IP6 for most of the internet already uh, through the Google over IP6 program. Uh, one key message from our perspective as a content provider is that we have seen deployments in every part of the world on every access technology, and these are real deployments, right? So this is the you know the Romanian network RCS, um, 23 percent, okay? Um, AT and T now you know pushing over six percent, and their stats say uh, publicly they published a number about over one million subscribers. Um, PPP, Access Roll in the Netherlands, Internode in, in, in Australia, 7%. Um, Verizon Wireless, LTE, dual stack, Android terminal. 60% of this is Android terminals doing uh, the IPv4 v6 PDP type and accessing all, all services over IPv6. So we've seen a real impact on the whole ecosystem. Um, you know, we've seen websites, we've seen router vendors, we've seen even you know terminal equipment, you know phone vendors. Uh, home router vendors actually enable IPv6, but turn it on by default, and leave it on. So we've seen a real step function. And uh, we've seen real deployments everywhere around the world using basically every access technology. So the next time that somebody says to you, I need the ITF to standardize this because otherwise I can't deploy it, 
think, you know, think carefully whether that's true or whether there are other ways to solve the deployment problem. Because all these networks beg to differ and say, actually, IPv6 is deployable right now. Okay. So um, with that, I'll um, hand it over to Lee. One slide. One, one slide. <laughs> How do we get to 1%? So a lot of people have said, what's the big deal about 1%? That's such a tiny little number, it doesn't even really matter. 1% is a huge number. 23% is a bigger number. Here's how you get to 1%. Half of cable modems have to be enabled to get to 1% of, you, of your users. That's 50%. Here's why. Because those cable modems are evenly distributed across your entire footprint, or close enough to evenly distribute it. And you have to, uh, so I've got, got here's a Venn diagram. I'm trying to show we've got half the, CIA of, the uh, of the cable modems times 30% of your CMTSs. So 30% of a footprint times 50% of a footprint uh, have to be enabled in order to get just that overlap there. So I've got red is for pink or something is for cable modems. Uh, the green is the CMTSs. So the overlap is that column down the middle. Now only about half of operating systems in uh, residential networks support IPv6. That has plus or minus maybe 5 or 10%. But that half is everything that's not Windows XP. Everything else counts. Windows XP still accounts for something like 40 to 50 percent of homes. Therefore, you have to enable so many devices in order to get down to the half of devices that are not the Windows XP in order to get something that can actually use the IPv6. So we're still multiplying fractions here. 50 percent times 30 percent times uh, 50 percent is down to a fairly small, now we're sort of in that middle rectangle there, not the, start, the part that's outlined in black yet. And then finally, um, I assumed, as we were going into, uh, into World IPv6 launch, that there were very few gateways in the world that supported IPv6 on by default. Um, so I assumed, that, so when I was uh, trying to figure out how many users are we actually going to get, how much footprint do we actually have to enable, you have to look at those users who don't have a home gateway. As, as John pointed out, the people who are directly connecting a, a device into their cable modem, and that's about 15%. So that takes it down to a very, very small number. And so what you get is the overlap of the Venn diagram union, uh, sorry, the intersection of all of those sets is that little area that's uh, outlined in black. As it turns out, Time Warner Cable has on the closed order of 10 million residential subscribers. So this is a 10 by 10 matrix. Each of those blocks, therefore, is 100,000 users. And that dark area is slightly over 1%. It's uh, each block is 1%, so it's a little bit more that way and a little bit less that way. So we have to enable a huge amount of footprint in order to get to 1%. So this is it. So the point that I'm trying to make is 1% doesn't sound like a lot, but since you're multiplying so many fractions, it actually is a huge rollout. It represents a huge deployment in any network in order to get that much actually using IPv6. Thank you. Let Eric talk, we'll come back. Hey, Eric Nigren, Um So what we did on World IPv6 launch is allow our customers um, to make this, to opt in and make their um, sites available over IPv6 permanently. And we, on our network right now, we have IPv6 in over 53 countries around the world and in 600 of our locations. Some of the major factors that contribute to IPv6 growth, as other people have alluded to, is how much content is available out there, what is, um, how many of the clients actually have network connectivity over IPv6, and finally, um, what is the client adoption rate? Many of these things that Lee was alluding to in terms of how much OS support is there, browser support is there, um, blocking from um, problems with um, CPE equipment or um, other types of embedded devices. And when you combine all of these factors together, what we saw is very significant growth of, um, as part of World IPv6 launch. In particular, the amount, of, the number of IPv6 addresses we saw year over year between 2011 and 2012 went up 400, over 400 fold, up to 19 million IPv, unique IPv6 addresses. And the number of requests we served just during that 24-hour period of World IPv6 launch was over 3 billion requests over IPv6. So this combination of more content and more clients does mean more traffic. And 
even though a lot of these are taking a bunch of small fractions and multiplying them together, one side effect of that is, is all it takes is taking one of those small fractions and doubling it means that now you've doubled the overall aggregate number. So where, where are these clients coming from and how are they connecting? Um, taking a look at the number of those 19 million addresses we saw, Teredo is fairly um, negligible in the number of addresses it contributes to. Um, six to four is, is still there in addresses, although a lot of clients are starting to disprefer it and not use it as much. Um, we are seeing that there are some parts of the world where there is actually more six to four still than there is native IPv6. Like, um, in, um, for example, <coughs> um, India and Brazil have more six to four than native IPv6, although pre presumably um, is because of the small amount of native IPv6. But native and 6RD does contribute for a huge portion of the IPv6 addresses out there. One of the biggest changes um, from a network perspective over the past year is that some of these big top US ISPs came into the fray and really started making IPv6 available to their end, end user subscribers. So between those top six networks, 86% of the IPv6 requests we saw came from those. Verizon Wireless alone, with with their Android LTE devices, was over a third of the IPv6 traffic we saw during that 24-hour window. When you start looking at the geography, the US um, has been a huge contributor to growth. There have been a lot of perceptions over the past few years that um, IPv6 is something that's just in Asia or just in Europe. That's very much not the case anymore. Um, Kind of a comment to George, by the way, is actually even Vatican City does have significant amounts of IPv6 that we, we saw when looking at some of the numbers. Um, it just kind of jumped out of the staff. It's like, whoa, they have IPv6 in the Vatican. Um, so one downside is that there is IPv6 malware out there. If, we, if you have a site that's available over IPv6, you may start seeing some port scans from infected hosts going and try, um, trying to look at that. Um, your, your server and saying, um, hey, can I attack you over IPv6? And a lot of this is because the um, malware authors will just use standard OS libraries. So as soon as one of those hosts gets IPv6 connectivity, the malware will just start using that IPv6 connectivity to launch some of the attacks that it had been launching before. And looking at a sample of data, you can see that some of the malware distribution mirrors, um, geographically mirrors pretty closely the address distribution. Now, um, what this doesn't mean is that people should worry about this to the point of not doing IPv6. IPv6 is here, it's on its permanent. It's just that when you deploy IPv6, you have to deploy security alongside it. You can't say, oh, there's no IPv6 malware, I'll put, put, um, put security off and do it as a later. Just as with anything else, you need to do security along with everything else you're doing. One of the top questions that we get from content provider sites is, when I make my site available over IPv6, what percentage of requests will come, um, come to my site? What is that client preference rate or the, the percentage of traffic that will come to a dual stack site over IPv6? And the thing we saw is that it really varies by audience if you, and, by, and thus by site. Um, on this graph, we see a number of different customers of ours, just picking a few samples of of customers of various sizes and various distributions and looking at the traffic over the past um, two, two months. And uh, a few things pop out, one of which is that um, if you have an audience that's just kind of global consumer end users, you're going to have um, um, less IPv6 preference, somewhere in the half a percent to one and a half percent range. Whereas if you're at the other end and you have a audience that's in a particular country with lots of IPv6 or you're a a router manufacturer, you may have an IPv6 preference rate that's in the two to three percent, or even in the um, even even higher. And across all, almost all of these, one thing we are seeing is there is ongoing growth. Um, in that, if you kind of look at this over the past two months, there is a, a few percent week over week growth. Probably the most dramatic num um, shift we saw is that the is the overall IPv6 preference rate within the U.S. among a a sample of consumer websites over the past year has gone up by a factor of nine. It started off the, um, la um, last year around the time of World IPv6 Day being somewhere a little over 0.1%, so kind of in the almost nothing, whereas as these big US ISPs have come in, um, into play, that's actually jumped up to 1% over the past year. 
So as this continues to grow in the U.S., as other networks keep turning this on, as more content becomes available over the next few years, hopefully we'll get to a point where IPv6 becomes the dominant Internet protocol. Uh, we have some more stats up on our website as well. Great. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you all very much. And I think we've done quite well in terms of uh, respecting time. So we actually have time for discussion, which is wonderful. Um, and I think I'd like to start off by asking the panelists if they have anything that they want to ask each other, having had the opportunity to see some of the impact uh, from slightly different perspectives than maybe in their own data. So anybody want to dive in? So uh, Eric, question. Is this thing on? Yeah. Okay. Um, have you been able to identify any performance differences um, based on you know either V6 and V4 or v various V6 technologies? We've not dug into we've not dug into that at a great detail yet. That's something we're starting to do. There is certain when you're deploying across the world, many of our network providers don't necessarily have IPv6 yet, um, which is a, a challenge we're facing. But at the same time. Those are generally correlated with the end users in that area not having IP, IPv6 yet. Um, so we haven't seen a, drama a dramatic shift there from a, a protocol perspective. They're fairly similar. We have seen, though, um, more brokenness on the IPv6 internet than on the IPv4 internet. There are, for example, there are tier one ISPs out there um, who refuse to go and get tra either transit or, or peering um, with some with certain other ISPs, so there are actually places on the V6 internet, in particular in some parts of Europe, where there is no path from um, between um, point A and point B. We've actually seen that. Part, part of the reason that we've uh, we conducted the measurements that we've done is not only to find problem areas, but to meaning where it's slow, but also to identify areas where it's absent altogether, because uh, that would be bad. Yeah. And one thing that, um, Lee, you mentioned that your assumption in putting together the graph was that there wouldn't be significant deployment of V6 in CPE equipment. Uh, did, do you think that played out, or how do others see it? I turned out to be entirely mistaken on that point. Um, John actually had a, had a graph showing, what you say, 30% compared to 30% of users had home gateways that supported V6. Um, we have seen um, not quite 30%, but uh, something like 15 or 20% of our users who have IPv6 um, are also pull that's 15 to 20% of our users who have gotten a DHCP v6 assignment have also gotten an, IPv, uh, an IAPD assignment. Therefore, I assume that that is a, a network device. Yeah, I had a question for Lorenzo about the um, that map of uh, breakage, IPv6 breakage you showed. Um, there's, I mean, my impression is that there's not a lot of that, but it's, I mean, the geographical distribution is kind of curious. And, and have you got to the bottom of what all of that is? Is it just a handful of things or, you know, I mean, like I think Chile's on there is having quite relatively high breakage. I mean, that seems bizarre to me, but maybe it makes more sense to you because you've dug into it. It seems to be correlated, well, um, it, it seems to be correlated uh, with, with, um, with the exception of Japan, which is really a very complicated case um, uh, involving sort of closed networks and wall guards and so on. Uh, except, you know, with the exception of Japan, it seems to be strongly correlated with very large ISPs uh, apparently shipping CPEs that have bugs. And um, it, you know, when when it's the number one ISP in a country, and you know, 10% of its users has this bug, then you know the, the whole country turns red because they're big enough, right? So we're seeing that 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 we've actually you know if you if you go and look, it it seems to be the dominant ISPs in Chile and Colombia, and soon Argentina as well. Uh, we expect Argentina to turn red soon because they they seem to be uh, shipping these devices that have basically announced broken connectivity into the home. We have tried to talk to them, but it, 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 it seems a difficult problem to solve. OK. Um, and I will shortly be opening up the mics on the floor. If people have questions, you can uh, get yourself ready to ask them. Uh, but one thought question for the panel. Um, 
would you say we are now at the point, or when would we be able to say we are at the point where if you only have IPv6 connectivity, you can say that you are actually on the Internet? We're going to have to give them a minute to think about that. Well, I mean, I, I'll just dive in. I mean, you know, it, I think it is, well, from, you know, my immediate reaction is it depends what applications you want to use, right? I mean, there are, there are a handful of popular applications that work just fine today uh, if all you have is IPv6 connectivity. Um, but there's also some applications that I make, uh, you know, intensive use of that really just don't work. So um, we're not there yet, or I'm not there yet because of my application mix. Um, you know, maybe others have a different view. What we've seen, lastly, with the breakup of uh, the breakdown of devices within the home. Um, so, if, depending on what you, you know, if you're referring to a single device, you know, I think it's maybe the constraints that the MAT enumerates are are completely, you know, legitimate. But at least from our point of view, we, you know, we still think we're a little ways from that, largely because, um, you know, it's it's more than just a single device in the home. It's every device in the home. It's some of the behavior of the various operating systems and devices and how they and how they rely. You know, there's still some reliance on IP4. And really making sure that we have an intersection of kind of this least common denominator between for V6 within the home for these devices, so that they can they have all the tools that they need to, to truly be V6 only. Plus the fact that, like I said, there there's just some devices out there that have have no future uh, from a V6 point of view. Um, yeah. uh, from our perspective, right? If you, if you from Google's perspective, if you if we turned off IPv4, IPv4 tomorrow, and we'd lose upwards of 99% of our users. Um, so <laughs> I would say well, we, we wouldn't lose them. I mean, some of them would come in over six to four, but you know it it, it, you know, it would be they would be either be unable to reach us or they'd be reaching us using suboptimal transition techniques. So for us, for us, it's likely going to be a very long time before we you know even consider um, you know turning off IPv4. Right. So I would I would probably tend to answer the question, of course, from, from the other side, which is when can any given user have an IPv6 only access service? And I would like to encourage the Internet Society to keep asking that question because I think the answer is going to change. I would love to keep hearing it as it changes. Yeah, I, I did ask it sort of as a, as a, you know, here's this point in time in this context kind of a question. Um, because if I had asked the same question a year ago, you know, eyes would roll back in their sockets and it was like, look, can we just get a little bit of a deployment, please, before we talk about having that only? And I imagine the answer is going to be quite different a year from now. But unfortunately, it's you know we are at a point where it isn't really an academic question. There are parts of the world where new networks are coming online, and the only way to get address space is in IPv6. So yes, there are coping mechanisms. Yes, there's six to four, but you know so, yeah. we're going through that ugly bit of transition. So, so my preferred transition strategy is uh, IPv4 over carrier pigeon. You know, you you get <laughs> you 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 give your user real IPv6 connectivity. And then for everything else that doesn't support IPv6 yet, you provide some form of legacy backwards compatibility. And frankly, you could take the position that how good that connectivity is is not as important, right, as the fact that it's there at all. Right? So even if it's maybe you know not a, not quite as good, maybe that's okay because anyone who suffers from that connectivity can simply you know remove that penalty by deploying IPv6. So for for example, if you're a website and you know say 5% of your users have IPv4 over carrier pigeon, you can simply deploy IPv6 and, and um, you know, just get rid of the carrier pigeon. Right. And okay. some, and I think it, it, it's certainly worth taking a look at what some of the mobile networks are, have been doing, like what how T-Mobile has been deploying IPv6 into their network as a model of what many people may do in the future, They're, of having a network that is v6 only and where when you want to go out to the outside world for the Content that's still v4 only, then you go through a NAT six, kind of NAT64 at xlat64 type setup. Um, the, it is worth noting that although on that Alexa top 500 list, you, that those numbers may have been up to a quarter, but that's still three quarters of those top 500 sites and and millions of other sites in the long tail that don't have v6 yet. And for some applications, it's not necessarily straightforward just to go and make v6 available because it reaches fairly deep into, company, into companies' infrastructures. All right, I will go ahead and say what I was going to say. I've heard of this organization called the IETF um, that, in which I have seen a document describing uh, an operational experience with NAT64 as a translation. And basically it says NAT64 works great as long as you only need the web. 
know, and, and Eric, just one comment to the to the not just for I me. Mean, we've had this conversation a bit with Cameron as well. I think in some networks, maybe that that approach is more viable than others. Yeah, you know, I couldn't imagine having to do that for you know a hundred megabit service to more than you know, just a few people, right? So it's the context is extremely relevant as right. far as some of those are concerned. Yeah, I guess mobile is actually not a specific context in that you have a class of particular devices running particular operating systems within the LTE yeah. context. Yeah. yeah, something like 464, where the carrier pigeons actually fly over v6, is is a, is a good is a good fit for that because if you look at Android, maybe 90, 85 to 90 percent of the applications do support v6, and for the rest, you can put them over the carrier pigeon. Great, and now we have a line of the mic, so you can be spared my academic questions. Tim. Hi, my name is Tim Shepard, and sometime last year, well, actually. During last year, at routinely at home, my laptop, which I usually only use when I'm away from home, but when I am home, I get it up on the wireless net, and I usually wind up setting an address by hand for IPv4 and the IPv4 default router and IPv6 address at home and IPv6 default router because I don't have a DHCP server at home and I don't have router advertisements for IPv6 on my home wireless network. But that's a lot of typing to have to type those four things in. So I used to routinely set the IPv4 address and set the IPv6 address and set the IPv6 default route. And I also, peculiarly, a little unusual on my laptop, I'm, my full service DNS resolver is pointing right back at the laptop where I'm also running a name D. So there I have a name D that has IPv6 connectivity to the world, but no IPv4 connectivity. And everything I wanted to do, which was mostly moving stuff between machines at home, would work fine. Um, but a wonderful thing happened at some point in 2011. I discovered that if I opened my web browser and forgot to add a default route for IPv4, that I was able to look at www.ietf.org. And it all worked except for the little YouTube video that was <coughs> there last year. Um, depressingly enough, I haven't, I'm not sure I've tried within the last couple of months, but I wasn't able to find any other example of a website that I would want to look at, which I could see without at least my DNS resolver having IPv4 connectivity. So I think a wonderful thing is if this test, which I'm going to keep doing, started working. I don't think last time I tried, I was able to get to www.google.com um, because that still required, I believe there were no glue records in the DNS to get to all IPv6 DNS resolution. So I, I'm looking forward to the day when there's more examples other than www.ietf.org. And I don't know if the content providers that are here today would like to answer when do you think I might hope that that might work for your content? Uh, since you call us out by name. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I hate to say it, but that's not the target audience, right? I mean, the um, uh, at least you know personally, I think that we should optimize for um, what you know most users do, which is use their ISPs DNS server, and we assume that sort of in the in the short to medium term, there will be enough IPv4 addresses for ISP DNS servers to maintain dual stack connectivity. So we are working on v6 glue, but um, in order to do that, we need to show conclusively that there is no impact to users of publishing said glue. And um, it's going to take a while, because if you saw what we had to do for World IPv6 launch, enabling IPv6 for the web host names was a major effort that involved an industry-wide collaboration, <laughs> and it took it took over a year. So, um, and in this case, there's even less bang for that buck. So we're working on it. It's possible that the numbers say that there's no damage to publishing v6 glue. If so, we'll just do that. But if not, yep. uh, I'm just going to interject that we are dangerously close to running out of our time. So if we can keep questions and comments. <clears throat> If, if I can just make a quick comment to that last question. I'm, I'm a DNS geek, and I measure v4 and v6 DNS going to the reverse tree. And going back over about a year and a half's data, the population of v4 resolvers that query is essentially stable. It's 7 million IPs a day that come. The v6 dynamic is a rising wave that's an exponential growth. And I would say probably later this year or early next year, 
they're going to get within the order of magnitude of each other. So if you try this experiment again in a year's time, I think you're going to find that V6 infrastructure DNS comfortably handles queries for V4 payload for you. You shouldn't have a problem asking questions where you're transport six, but if you're asking for quad A's, that's a long, hard road. So you've got to differentiate between the two, how you're getting it and what you're asking for, different problem. But as far as the transport part's concerned, the infrastructure's getting there. Great, thanks. Russ? Hi, Russ Housley. So last Friday, those of you who weren't traveling may have noticed uh, morning Vancouver time that the uh, IETF web server was not available. It's because there was a denial of service attack against our server, and for the first time, all of the traffic taking the, that server down was IPv6. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there may be a new metric in there. Thanks. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is Saurabh from NEC India. My question to panel is, uh, what do you think is the major uh, challenges uh, we are facing to launch IP? Why service provider are reluctant? And how to convince them in a country like India, their migration strategy, so rather than promoting their slowing down, I think. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> The, the, the long pole that I see in, where, in most places I talk is uh, consumer electronics. Um, I don't think that's pro if, but you're talking about wire service providers dragging their feet. My guess right now would be twofold. One is uh, stable code on their edge devices, um, depending on their, uh, depending on what topology or yeah, what, what kind of access method you use. Um, and the other one is I still see service providers who say, I have enough addresses to last me for a few years. Why do I care about IPv6? I, I try then to point out that their users might want to reach my users, and they, we might want to have a common communications protocol to do that with. Uh, I keep, I still keep hearing there is no content, um, and I really like the fact that John published his 40% number because what John is saying is that when he turns on v6 for user, 40% of that user's traffic switches to v6. I, I wish you would publish that number more widely. Uh, I'll just add as well that it may be that if, as an ISP, you've already decided that CGN is the way to go, then, um, you know, you know, well, yeah, but, yeah, well. Yeah. But I think that that's part of the overall, hopefully, the overall impact of this, uh, of this activity is to really highlight that there are a lot of service providers that have done it, and, uh, you know, at this point, there are fewer reasons not to because your competition is. Just uh, one comment, Leslie. So, so I don't know about to initiate the uh, deployment v6. But I know that from our point of view, I, I, I like to agree. The 40% number, while it's a, it's, a, it's a nice number, and we're going to work to kind of tighten that up a little bit, and then perhaps you know, message that a little bit more broadly. We, we do feel that there's still 60% to go, right? Um, so going back to Lee's comment about consumer electronics, uh, that's an area where we're doing a lot of work. Um, there is a there is a working group in the CEA that I'm involved with, um, and and that's really where we're investing some time to kind of move that needle. Okay. Next question. Yes, uh, Stephen Wright, at and uh, Firstly, I'd like to thank ISOC for um, pulling together the World V6 launch event. I think this has really been a big help in getting all of the different access providers engaged and getting service out there. I think this really is a demonstration that it does work across all sorts of different access infrastructures from cable, from DSL, from wireless, and so forth. Uh, my real question is, what's next? And I'll look at the panel. I, I think that with we're done. Two things I heard from the, <laughs> the, the topic were, were the application space and the CP space. And so, so Stephen, um, so John Brzezowski here. So I think one of the areas that, that we're, we're looking to pursue is uh, to perhaps advance from the home networking space. Uh, seems like a pretty logical extension from where, you know, much of the work that we've had to do already, right? So back in 2009, we had done some work to kind of try to move some of the V6 adoption along in that space. You know, we had done some work with you know, some, some of the folks in this room. Um, and, and I think there is an opportunity there, at least, you know, if you're, if you're asking for kind of some speculative thoughts or even some areas where we're, we're looking to do some work, that's one area. Um, I, I had a conversation with someone recently who said he does 802.1Q VLANing in the home. And I was like, what? You've actually found the need for it? He said, yeah, I run a guest net. And I think thinking in new ways, not having no addresses to play with, means you can start to think in new ways. We can start to get ideas out there that you can run a guest net and a this net and a that net and another net. 
different policies, different behaviors. So I think home net is where the action is, yeah. Um, I'd like to say we're not out of the woods yet. Um, so um, uh, we are not in self-sustaining mode yet. We need more traffic, we need more services, we need more ISPs. Um, if you look at Google services, not all services support IPv6, even ones that were launched recently. And that is because from the point of view of a developer, uh, if the additional cost to implementing v6 is substantial, then there's a cost-benefit trade-off that may end up winding in, you know, going in the favor of launch earlier with v4 only. Okay, So we need to change that equation because uh, if we want v6 to really um, be ubiquitous, then we have to fight against regressions as well, right? We, and the only way to do that is to keep pushing the uh, virtuous circle of, you know, the chicken and the egg and, and everything, you know, going smoothly. So, frankly, from our perspective, you know, the fact that these ISPs have done so much work and so much deployment, that is a major, major driver. Right? And those continue to be the drivers. And hopefully we can all sort of, as an industry, find drivers all over the place and keep the circle going. But we, it will require some vigilance. And you know, to Martin Levy's point at the panel last ATF, you know, you're not done. You need something new. I don't have an answer to that yet. Yeah, I, I'd like to come back to your point about um, John's number of 40%. You know, and and this whole notion of not sliding back. I think it's important to look at, you know, get ISPs to understand that if 40% of their any given customer traffic is going to be over IPv6, then that can help them in terms of uh, taking the pressure off of their v4 space, at least in some context, and think in that light. Um, but yes, in general, um, I think we alluded to the fact that the World IPv6 launch really was a question of bringing together um, the three legs of the stool, CPE vendors, content providers, and, and eyeball providers, um, in and really trying to bring them together in a way that unlatched a particular problem. Uh, I think that that was successful, um, but we're now at a point of saying, where is there something else where a little bit of, you know, uh, collaborative effort could undo some other chicken and egg situation? It may be more niche. It may not be quite as cross the board. Uh, it may be particular, um, it may be regional, it may be particular access types, it may be particular service industries. Um, but, you know, we're all in a context of trying to find somewhere to apply a lever. Um, you know, where can we get a big impact with a little bit of collaborative effort? Um, one, Lindo, one word. Leslie, can um, please keep publishing the stats <laughs> for, you know, until we get to 10%. Yeah. You know. Okay. That's a, that's a good place to end. And sorry, Mark, unless it's like five seconds or less, we are out of time. We are beyond out of time. Or go on. Cool. Do it. I was right. going to say, what right. that? Before, before you say it, I would ask everybody, as right. you, uh, can you take your lunch stuff with you through the portal back into the IETF? We've borrowed this space. We're appreciative of having this space, but we need to clean it up for the next working group session. Sorry, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you to our panelists.